This is kind of a big one. In this video, I'm gonna tie a lot of different things together. We're gonna to talk about multicam with anamorphic lenses, shooting to ProRes RAW, connecting with externally recorded audio, iPhone video, all of which is tied together with time code, and then we're gonna take all of that and push it into Premiere Pro. Yeah, let's get into it. If you saw the movie car scene that I shot a month or so ago, then this is what went into it. I'm gonna be explaining all the different pieces that went into that shoot, and we'll talk a little bit about that shoot as we go as well. But let's get through all the different pieces of hardware that goes into it. So first off, I said multicam, and that's gonna be obvious as we add multiple cameras into this. But one of the next big things is ProRes RAW. So let's start by talking about camera choice. To record in ProRes RAW, we need a camera that can output raw video. So I am a Lumix ambassador, so I am using the Panasonic Lumix cameras. In this case, I did this shoot with the Lumix BGH1, but this isn't the only choice. We also have the new Lumix BS1H, which is another great camera for this, or any of the S-series cameras will work as well. Of course, Lumix cameras aren't the only ones that output raw, but these are the ones that I'm working with. Okay, so we've got a camera that can output raw. Now let's put a lens on it. The lenses that I'm working with for this project are the Sure anamorphic lenses. And these things are beautiful. These are the new Micro Four Thirds anamorphic lenses, and you can see that they have gearing on them to be used in a rig with a follow focus system, and I just absolutely love these lenses. So these are the lenses that I use for this project. So let's go ahead and put this onto the camera. Next, we're gonna talk about raw capture. How do we capture ProRes RAW? Well, to do that, we're going to use the Atomos Ninja 5. You could also use the Ninja 5 Plus. The Ninja 5 is what I'm using here. So this device will allow us to capture the RAW to ProRes RAW. But before we put this onto the camera, let's talk about another piece of this, timecode. To add timecode into this, I'm using something called the Atomex Sync. Now the Atomex Sync is a module that attaches directly to the back of the Ninja. In fact, it attaches between the recorder and the battery. So let's get a battery that goes between the recorder and the battery. So we'll get that on there. And this timecode device can be both a transmitter and a receiver. It can be the server or it can be part of the network. We'll get into configuring this in just a moment, but the next thing we need to add is something to record to. I'm using the Angelbird SSD cards. This is the Atom X card, which is custom designed to fit within the Ninja 5. So let's slide that into place. So now I've got my raw recorder with timecode and the SSD. All right, let's get this thing onto the camera. I'm configuring this pretty simply. I'm going for kind of a minimalist setup here where I'm just mounting the monitor directly onto the camera. For the production that I did though, whenever I was hand holding it, I actually mounted the whole thing into a cage. This allowed me some more options like the handle on the top, the follow focus gear system, and so on. But for now, I'll just make it simple. To output the raw signal from the camera into the Ninja, we're of course going to need an HDMI cable. And you can't just use any old HDMI cable. You need a good one. You need something that is rated at 18 gigabits. That's gonna give you the data transfer speed to get that raw data into the recorder. All that's left is to put a battery on the camera and we're ready to go. All right, let's fire this up. With the Ninja connected, I'm gonna jump into the camera's menu system. And first let's check the frame rate and size that I'm currently set to. We'll go down to the record quality and you'll see here that it's set to Cinema 4K at 24p. This is one of the compatible outputs for RAW, so when I set it to that and switch over to RAW, it'll maintain the same settings. Then I simply go down to the next page where I'll find the HDMI RAW data output. I'll go ahead and turn that on, and at this point, the Ninja is going to sense the RAW signal and offer to reboot. Here it is, RAW signal detected, and we'll go ahead and hit OK. The Ninja reboots, and now it's in RAW recording mode. At this point, there's actually nothing to set up for RAW. All the settings that are required are transmitted over the metadata, and the recorder knows exactly what to do. But I'll show you the settings. If I go into the recording input, we can see that the source is over HDMI, and it's 4K at 2398. The camera is identified as a Panasonic, and the Gamma and Gamut are both set to Panasonic RAW. So everything we need for RAW capture is already set. The recording format is also already set to ProRes RAW. We can see that under the record menu, and you'll see that it's set to ProRes RAW. If I tried to switch it back to another format, it wouldn't let me. All right, now that the camera is configured for shooting ProRes RAW, let's talk about 
time code. I've already got the time code device on here, so let's take a look at its settings, which are also controlled from within the Ninja's interface. I'll slide over here to Sync Config. That's the Atomex Sync device. And from here, you'll see that we have a few options. This device can be either a server or a client. In this case, I want it to be the server. I can choose which channel it's on. And of course, every other time code device on the network needs to be on the same channel. So I'll go ahead and set it to channel six. There's an option over here called record control that is really cool. This allows me to trigger recording in other ninjas with the Atomex sync device attached from this ninja. Meaning if I have, let's say five of these all in sync and I tap record on this one, it'll trigger recording on all the others as well. And of course, when I hit stop, it'll stop them all too. Pretty slick. And finally, I'm ready to start the network. I can choose where it's getting the time code from here and we'll see that it's set to time of day. So we'll go ahead and set it to that. So now the hardware is set to time of day time code, which is getting from the clock that I set in the Ninja 5 and it's all ready to go. This device is set. Let's get this one out of the way and we'll add another recorder. I'm gonna take another Ninja 5, another Atomex sync and another battery and get this fired up. Now I'm ready to configure the second Ninja. I'll tap on the time code window and then tap on sync config. That's to configure the Atomex sync device that's connected. You'll see the network role is set to server. I'll change that to client. The channel is set to five, it needs to be six. So I'll fix that. And then I'll tap on join network. Just like that, it'll find the network and there it is, it's already connected. If I close this out, we'll now see the same time code on this device as we have on the other one. So now this one is all ready to go. We've got our second recorder, the first recorder all set and ready. Okay, there's no camera on there, but obviously you'd fix that. Now we're ready to integrate the other devices. Now there's a few different ways we can go about doing this. I have something here called the UltraSync 1. The UltraSync 1 is a tiny little time code box that can be both a transmitter and a receiver. In this case, I would set it up as a receiver and then connect this to any other device on my network that has regular time code inputs. You see your small time code output cables here. You just plug that into whatever camera or recorder would have it. But in this case, I'm gonna be using things that don't have direct time code in, but do have Bluetooth support. So instead of this, I'm gonna use the UltraSync Blue. The UltraSync Blue is a dedicated timecode device that transmits its timecode over Bluetooth. Now, truth be told, the Atom X Sync itself will also transmit Bluetooth, meaning that I can connect any Bluetooth device to it instead of having to use a separate device like this one. But here's the limitation of doing that. Bluetooth has very limited range and any device that you connect to it is not going to be a dedicated timecode device, which means it's not gonna have a quartz crystal inside of it, which means that it's not going to have the most accurate long-term timecode sync capability. It's gonna drift after a little while. Now we could be talking about hours here, but at the end of the day, it could drift. So what you wanna do is not have your Bluetooth devices get too far away for too long from the transmitter. Well, that's where this comes in. By having this tiny little device and then using this to Bluetooth connect all the other devices too, this can go wherever those go to. Does that make sense? Let me show you what I mean. I'll start by getting this connected to the network just like I did that recorder there. I'll power it up and I wanna make sure it's set to the same channel. So let's go down to the RF settings and set that to channel six. And just like that, it is going to now find the network and connect to it. In fact, we can check to see if these devices are on the network by looking at the status of the network on the original device. If I look on here under the sync network, we'll see camera C, that's the second ninja that I configured, and then blue 80, that is this little guy right here. So, so far, everything's on the network. All right, now let's connect some other hardware to this. We're gonna start with the Zoom F6. The Zoom F6 is a multi-track field recorder. It has six XLR inputs on it and has a Bluetooth module so it can connect to the Bluetooth transmitter in here. Let's see how to configure it. I'll power it up, go into the menu, navigate down, not to time code, which is where you might think you would go, but we actually have to go into the system settings and connect over Bluetooth. So go down to system, Bluetooth, and then time code. I'll go ahead and hit OK on time code and hit connect. And then here, I'm gonna go into the Bluetooth pairing menu and just let it search. There it is, it has found the F6. So now we've got our audio recorder linked up via time code with this, great. Now let's get another audio recorder on the network. 
I'm gonna use this little guy, the Zoom F2BT. This is a tiny little field recorder that comes with a lavalier mic, also has a headphone port, really handy, that records internally. So it's not a transmitter, it just records internally to a micro SD card, but that can also be added to your Bluetooth timecode network. Now to configure this, you actually have to connect it to a computer to start. I'll start by connecting this to USB and powering it on. Then I'll fire up the F2 editor on my computer. This is an app that you download from the Zoom website. Once it sees the F2, the one control we're concerned with is right here, the Bluetooth function. By default, it'll be set to F2 control. We wanna switch it over to timecode. That is telling the device to use its Bluetooth protocols for timecode. So all we have to do is enable that. And then if you're connecting to a new device, you might wanna click on forget device so it forgets any previous devices it was connected to. At this point, that's actually all you have to do. There's other settings in there you might wanna play with, but this is it. When I disconnect the hardware, it's going to automatically go into pairing mode. There's not much of an indicator that this is happening, but that's how it works. So I'm gonna go ahead and get the blue ready to start pairing and then disconnect this. And within a couple of moments, we should see the F2 appear on the blue's screen. There it is, the F2, we accept that. And now the two devices are in sync. Since there's no timecode display on the F2, the only indication that you have that it is actually connected is this little blinking light here. You'll see that these two lights are in sync the little light above the off switch there, that is the one that is indicating to me that they are in sync. As long as they're flashing at the same time, we know they're talking to each other. Of course, you may wanna do a test recording before you go on production to make sure that it actually has the time code, but that's what it takes to set that up. Okay, the last thing that I wanna connect is my iPhone. I mentioned using the iPhone video to incorporate with this production, so that's what we're gonna do using an app called Mavis. Let's check this out. In the Mavis app, if I go into the settings and scroll down a little bit, you'll see time code. With time code selected, scroll down some more, and you'll see UltraSync Blue slash AtomX Sync. Tap that, and it immediately goes into pairing mode. Now all I have to do is go into the blue, go back to Bluetooth pairing, and it's gonna find that pretty quickly. There's the iPhone, confirm that. And you can see here that the iPhone is now connected to the network. Let's go back out of the settings, and we'll see the time code now matches between the two devices. Now remember, this is an anamorphic production, so we need an anamorphic lens on the iPhone. For that, I'm gonna use the Moment anamorphic lens. We'll slide that on, pop off the lens cap, and there is anamorphic beauty on an iPhone. Now, this is just the iPhone 12, but the new iPhone 13 shoots ProRes. So now you've got a device that can shoot anamorphic time code synced ProRes on an iPhone in your hand. That's pretty awesome. All right, everything is set up. Let's go back to the camera here and just take a quick look at the screen. I wanna verify that everything is in here. So if I go to my sync network, we'll see everything listed. Starting at the bottom, there's camera C. That again is the second Ninja that I had connected. There at the very top is the blue, that's the Bluetooth device. And we can even see the additional Bluetooth components on the network through here. So we see the F2, the F6, and the iPhone all listed here on this display. So now we're ready to shoot our test. We're not gonna actually shoot it here. What we're gonna do instead is jump into a time machine and go to the other side of the world, to Europe, where I was when I recorded a test. So while you're doing that little time travel and watching the test that I did, I'm going to clear the desk here and set it up for our editing session. So uh, fancy time machine noises, and I'll see you in a second. I'll start recording on the lav, on the Zoom F6 with the boom mic. I'll start recording on the iPhone, and with record control turned on, I can start recording all the ninjas at once with one touch. And just like that, all devices are recording, all with time code. Camera A, camera B, camera C, camera D, the lavalier mic, and the boom mic. Let's get these files into the computer and check them out in Premiere Pro. Hello and welcome back. I hope you had a lovely trip. So let's get into editing. But before we start editing, let's look at the hardware that I've got set up here. First of all, you'll notice that I'm editing on a MacBook Air. This is an M1 MacBook Air, not the new M1 Pro or M1 Max, MacBook, M MacBook Pro M1 Max. They gotta do something about the name. This is just the M1 MacBook Air. Now, it's not the most powerful editing machine in the world, but you know what? It does a pretty darn good job. So that's what I'm editing on today. 
But because this is a relatively small screen, I also have over here an external monitor for editing. This is my Atomos Neon 17-inch reference monitor, and this is a thing of beauty. This is a relatively small and portable machine. There's actually a flight case you can get for this that holds the stand and all the parts in it beautifully. But this is gonna allow me to have a reference grade monitor on the road with me. Now this monitor at 17 inch is an HD resolution, but it does input 4K if you're working with a 4K interface, and it provides an HDR experience if you're editing in HDR. So this is an absolutely gorgeous monitor to have on the road or in the field. Now between this neon display and this M1 Mac is the Blackmagic Ultra Studio Monitor 3G. Now that tiny little piece of hardware there is the interface between these two devices. It is Thunderbolt from the Mac into the Ultra Studio and then HDMI or SDI into the Neon. Now you'll notice that I am running it over SDI here and there's a good reason for this. When you're running it with HDMI, you're limited to a 1920 wide resolution, that's full HD. However, this project was shot in DCI 4K, that's 4096 wide, and I'm going to be editing it in 4096 wide. However, if I edit in 4096 and preview in HD, I'm only going to be able to see 1920 wide at once, which is actually going to crop the edges of the scene off. However, if I connect the SDI cable, then I get full 2K DCI or 2048 pixels wide, so half the resolution of that 4K DCI. By going over SDI, I'll be able to monitor the full width of the shot on the Atomos Neon reference monitor. So that's my hardware setup. Finally, I have over here the BBRCU. This is a remote control unit for the Neon. This is not required, but it certainly does add a level of convenience, having these physical buttons here to access the monitor when you need it. If you're not using that, then you can control the monitor on an app on your phone or on the Mac. This is the app on the Mac. You can see here that I have full control over the input, which input is being used, whether it's SDR, or HDR, and so on. I can look at the monitor settings here. I can add a LUT, change the brightness settings, and so on. And if we go back here, I have full control over all of the settings in the monitor. But all of these buttons down here can actually be controlled over the BBRCU if you want to. All right, let's start editing. I've already copied all the footage onto the computer, so let's take a look at what those clips are. I've already organized and renamed these. So there's camera A, B, and C. Those are the shots from the BGH-1 with the Suri anamorphic lens captured on the Ninja 5 into ProRes RAW. This last shot, camera D, was from the iPhone with the Moment anamorphic lens. And then up top, we have our audio. There's audio A, which was the lav, recorded to the Zoom F2, and then audio B, the boom mic, recorded to the Zoom F6. So all of those shots were already in the computer. Now let's bring them into Premiere and start putting them together. I'll create a new project. We're just gonna call this Atomos Demo. Click OK, leaving everything at the default settings. I'll start by importing my media. And I'm going to go ahead and select the folders, audio and video. That way I keep everything organized the same way in Premiere as I had it in the Finder. There's my shots and there's camera A. Let's start with this. Right away you'll notice that there's two things that need to be addressed. For one, it's distorted. Remember, we shot this anamorphic, so that means I have to tell Premiere what aspect ratio I shot it in. Second, it appears to be extremely overexposed. It's not, it's just because it was shot raw, and by default, Premiere has applied a Rec. 709 look to that. So we're gonna go in and change the color space from Rec. 709 to V-Gamut V-Log for this Panasonic footage. But let's start with the aspect ratio. All four of these shots need the same treatment, so I'll select those, right-click, go to the Modify menu, and then Interpret Footage. From here, I have a pixel aspect ratio option, which by default, of course, is square, but I can set that to whatever I want, depending on the lenses that I used. In this case, what I'm looking for is the number, and right here it's 1.333. That matches the 1.33 distortion of the Suray anamorphic lenses. Click OK, and we'll see that footage corrected. Now, depending on your hardware and software configuration, you may or may not be getting the correct aspect ratio sent out over the interface into the monitor. In this case, I'm not seeing it, so I'm gonna go ahead and correct that, and I'm gonna do that in hardware by going into the F3 mode here, and then pressing on the anamorphic distortion mode until I get to the 1.33x anamorphic distortion on the monitor. This is a fantastically powerful option. This means that I can take this monitor into the field as a reference monitor while shooting anamorphic footage and preview the anamorphic footage correctly distorted on the monitor for the director or whoever might be watching it. This is awesome. But let's get back to editing now. Next, let's correct this apparent overexposure. I'll go into the effects controls and from here, you'll see under ProRes RAW source settings that the color space is currently set to BT709. I want to change that to VGamut slash VLog, and as soon as I do, 
we'll see that image corrected both in Premiere and on the Neon reference monitor. What we're looking at now is effectively log footage. We still need to do some color correction or add a LUT to it, but we're no longer in that apparently highly overexposed raw space. So now we're just basically looking at log, which means the next step is to add a LUT to this. Now you could add a standard Rec. 709 LUT, or you could add a creative LUT if you have one that goes from log to your creative look. Most likely you'll go from log to Rec. 709 and then from Rec. 709 to your creative look, but of course that's entirely up to you. In this case, I'm going to go ahead and install the generic standard LUT from Panasonic that is designed to go from log to Rec. 709. Now that LUT is not included in Premiere, so let me show you how to get that. First of all, under the color tab, you'll see that under the LUT input, I have a variety of LUTs to choose from, but Panasonic is not on that list. To find that LUT, you can just do a Google search for Panasonic LUT log to Rec. 709, or I've also included a link down below to where you can download that from the Panasonic website directly. I've already downloaded that, so to load it, I simply go to Browse, locate that downloaded folder, and select the .cube file. Open that, and it applies it. And there you can see the footage now looks like Rec. 709. I want to add a little bit more contrast to this though, so I'm going to go ahead and add some curves to this. I'll go to the curves menu and just pull the shadows down a bit, pump up the highlights a touch, and there I've got a really good base look. I want to apply this same base look to the other raw shots that I did. So to do that, instead of having to repeat this process, I'm going to save presets. Now I'm going to have to save two presets, one for the Lumetri panel where I added the LUT and also added the curves, and another one for the effects panel where I made the color space conversion. So let's start with Lumetri. I'll go here to the hamburger menu and choose Save Preset. I'm going to call this one Raw Log to 709 and click OK. Then I'll go to the Effects Controls and under ProRes Raw Source Settings, I need to click here, not up on the hamburger menu under Effects Controls, but right click right here, right next to where it says ProRes Raw Source Settings and choose Save Preset. And this one I'll call ProRes Raw to Log. Tap OK, and there we have both presets. Now let's go to the Effects tab. I'll search for RAW to find the two presets I just created. Then go back down to my video folder, select clips B and C, not D, because remember that came from the iPhone, so it doesn't need any of this work, just B and C, and then take these two presets and drag and drop them both on at once. Now, if I preview these, you'll see that it has the correct aspect ratio and the LUT applied to it. Okay, this shot, as well as shot number C, both have an odd white balance to them. I blame the DP on this. He clearly didn't know what he was doing. So I'm going to go ahead and make some quick corrections in here. I'm not going to worry about making them super accurate, but I'll just go ahead over to the color tab, go to the basic corrections, and let's just cool this shot down a bit. Then I'll take camera C and cool it down a bit as well. And how about I take camera D, the iPhone one. Let's take a quick look at that. It looks like it could use a little bit of cooling too, as well as a little bit of an exposure boost. Again, I'm not really trying to make them match right here, just trying to make them look a little bit better. Okay, all of my four video clips are ready to go, A through D, but I'm not ready to make the multicam quite yet. Let me jump down to audio first and take a look at these. Here's the audio off of the lavalier mic. And just like that, all devices are recording. And here's the audio from the boom. Whoa, where's the audio from the boom? Well, here's the thing. The boom mic was set pretty far away and I didn't really set levels on it properly. So what it recorded is barely visible on the waveform monitor. However, this was recorded to the Zoom F6, which records in 32-bit float, which means I have an immense amount of wiggle room to recover my audio. Now, it's still not gonna sound great because the boom was really far away. That's not the point, but let me show you what I can do with this. Starting off here, we see almost nothing in the waveform monitor. And of course, if I play that back, you can barely hear anything at all. However, if I right click on this and choose to change the audio gain, I'm gonna adjust the gain by whopping 32 dB, hit okay, and there's the waveform. And just like that, all devices are recording. Great. So now we're ready to make that multicam clip. But first I've got a tip for you. When you select all the media to make the multicam clip, the order that you select the media in actually makes a difference. The first clip that you select will define the project size and frame rate for the sequence that will get made. Now, if all of the video is identical, then this doesn't matter. But in this case, it's actually not because all the footage that came off of the BGH1 with the Ninja 5 was shot DCI. So that's 40, 96 pixels wide. However, the shot that came off of the iPhone was simply Ultra HD, only 38, 40 pixels wide. So I don't want the whole project to end up at 38, 40. I want it at full DCI. So I want to make sure that I select my camera A first. So I'll go ahead and select camera A. 
and then select the rest of the video clips and then audio A and B as well. Right click and choose create multi-camera sequence. Incidentally, if I selected the wrong clip first, I can override and choose whatever sequence preset I want here. Let's go ahead and give this a name. We'll just call it multicam and then we'll set the sync point. The sync point is going to be set to timecode because of course, remember, we have timecode on all of these clips, which makes synchronizing them super easy and super accurate. Next, my audio. Under audio, I have three options, camera one, all cameras, and switch audio. I want camera one, but let's first talk about what the others are. All cameras will use all the audio from all the cameras, while switch cameras will switch the audio with the camera as you switch your multicam angles. That's not what I want. But I also don't want the audio from camera one. What I actually want is the audio from the separate audio recordings. Well, when you select camera one, if Premiere sees audio from separate recordings, it's smart enough to know that you actually want the audio from those other recordings. It'll go ahead and disable the audio on all the video tracks and choose to use just the audio on those original recordings. And you can, of course, change that at any time if you need to, but that's how it's set by default. All right, let's go ahead and leave that at camera one. Click OK, and there's the multicam. I'll double click on that to open it up here in the preview. And here we can see all four of those angles. And then I'm also gonna right click on that and choose to open this in the timeline. Now we can see the entire project. First, there's the audio from the lab. That is what starts first because that's what I hit record on first. Then there's the audio from the boom mic. And then there is the iPhone footage and then all three of the shots that came off of the ninjas. So all of our footage is there and ready to go but there's a little bit of a problem with the iPhone footage. Look up here. You'll notice that the iPhone shot, camera D over here, has pillar boxes on it. That's because, once again, this is only 3840 wide and it's now sitting on a 4096 sequence. So do I want to scale everything down to match that or scale the iPhone footage up just a tiny bit to make it match the rest of it? I'll go with scaling up. It's not much of a scale and I'm not gonna use that shot much, so I'm gonna go ahead and scale that up. To do that, I'll double click on the camera D iPhone clip here go to the effects controls, select it in the multicam, and then go to scale and I'll type in 107% because that's all it's gonna take. Now, if I go back to the multicam view, you'll see that that is now filling the canvas there. Next, I wanna make an audio setting change to the multicam itself. Because remember, we have two different audio tracks in here and the software doesn't know which one is the priority, which one I wanna use. Currently, both are active, but I don't actually want both of them. So let me show you how this works. I'll go to multicam, Select that and choose Modify Audio Channels. Here we have Clip 1 and Clip 2. Those are our two audio tracks, the lavalier at the top and the boom mic here at the bottom. I don't want the boom, so I'm going to go ahead and just turn that off for now. But in fact, I don't even want two clips to contend with. I really only want one at a time. So I'll enter one right here, and now I just have this one audio clip. And at any time I can go in here and switch, whether it's using the lavalier or the boom mic. So I'm gonna leave it on the lab for now, but we'll see how this comes into effect for the boom mic later on. In this type of a situation, you might be using the boom mic as a safety track. You've got a lavalier on the talent, I got a boom as a safety, in case there's some kind of a clothing rustle on the boom mic, we've got a safety track to go back to, or whatever your situation might be. Okay, that multicam sequence is now finally set up and ready to go. To ensure that I have the exact same settings that started from the original clip, which are now in the multicam, which I now want to make sure are in the sequence, I'm gonna create the new sequence by simply dragging that multicam clip onto the new button like this. I'll go here, drag this onto new, and it creates that new project for me. Let's zoom into that a little bit. And we can see here the entire project. Now you can see that from the waveforms here that I did two different takes on this. I know it's the second take that I want. So I'll put the playhead at the beginning of the second take, tap the Q button on the keyboard to cut off the first part of that. And then I'll put the playhead at the end of that take and tap the W to trim the end off of there. And now finally, we have our footage that we want to edit from. So how do we go about seeing all the different camera angles at once? Well, for that, we need to actually first add a new button to the toolbar that's not there by default to enable the multicam view. Here's how you do that. I'll first switch over to the editing tab. And then over here under the program monitor, I have a plus button. If I open that, you'll see that I've entered the button editor. The first clip that I wanna add is this one called Toggle Multicamera View. I'll go ahead and drag that down onto the button bar. And the second one is this Multicamera Record. I'll go ahead and drag that down as well. Click OK. And now when I enable the Multicam View, we're gonna see all of those angles at once. Let's go ahead and make this a little bit bigger so we can see all of them clearly. And I'm finally ready to edit my Multicam. To start editing, I hit that Record button and then hit Play. 
While it's playing, I'm going to use the keys on the keyboard, one through four, to switch between camera angles one through four. Once we're done, we hit stop, recording automatically stops, and we can go back and re-edit as needed. Let's do it. I'll enable record, put the playhead at the beginning, tap play, and off we go. And just like that, all devices are recording, all with time code. Camera A, camera B, camera C, camera D, the lavalier mic, and the boom mic. And there are edits are in place. As I scrub through here, you can see all the changes that were made. If I made a mistake, let's say right here, I didn't really want this to be on camera three, but instead I wanted it on camera two. I'll go ahead and make that change. And now it changes over from camera four to camera two, and then back to camera one. And finally, remember, I have that boom mic track. So how do I select that boom track if I need it? Well, to do that, I simply slice around the audio that I want to change and then change the audio controls like this. Let's first play this back, the lavalier mic and the boom mic. So right there where I say, and the boom mic is where I want it to be the boom mic. So I'll grab the razor blade tool, put a slice here and here, and then right click on that segment, go to audio channels and switch it from channel one to channel two. Click okay, and here we go. The lavalier mic and the boom mic. Let's get these files into the computer and check them. So there you have it, your basics of ProRes RAW multicam editing in Premiere Pro. So let's recap everything that went into this. We started with the Lumix BGH-1 and the Sure anamorphic lenses, feeding into a bank of Atomos Ninja 5 recorders to record in ProRes RAW. We also had the iPhone with the Moment lens also recording anamorphic, not to ProRes, but you could with the iPhone 13. And then we had the two audio recorders from Zoom, the Zoom F6 to record with the shotgun mic, and then the Zoom F2 to record off the lavalier. All of that had timecode sync from the Atomos timecode generators. So what does this look like in a real world scenario? Well, I shot a small movie scene using all of this technology for this project, and I'd love to share that with you now. For this scene, I hired a stunt driver and a car and an actress and a small crew to put this thing together, and it was a lot of fun to do, and again, using everything that we just talked about today. So here it is, check that out. Thanks as always for watching everybody. I hope you enjoyed this and learned something along the way. And as always, I'll see you in the next video.